In some previous videos, I discussed the feasibility and benefits of setting up a consistent and sustainable harvest system on your land using Silvicultural's mapping and harvest planning tools. But there are some operational risks to the strategy that you have to be aware of. If you aren't careful, you can really find yourself in some absurdly maddening and unproductive situations. So careful planning of your harvest system is critical. Today, to save you guys many hours and probably an entire bottle of ibuprofen, I wanted to go over four things that you absolutely need to consider. And I'm going to be focusing on the trail system because really, that's at the heart of a well-planned harvest. After all, cutting trees is easy. Moving trees to the woods? Eh, not so much. So the first thing that you need to consider is the permanence of your trail system. You might be harvesting your land piecemeal in small sections, but you need to be establishing your trails as if you're harvesting everything at once, or at least as if you're harvesting large sections at once. And this one is honestly more about land production efficiency than harvest efficiency. Trails are a necessary evil, but they are still evil. A poor trail system can negatively impact up to 40% of your forest. If you're short term and you're thinking and planning your trails on the fly, there's a very high risk that you're going to end up over time with a nonsensical trail network going all over the place and it's going to result in a lot of damage to your forest and it'll really kill the value as well as the aesthetics. So you have to plan one trail system to use multiple times, ideally forever. Next we have skid distance. Skid distance is how far you have to move your wood to get it to the landing, which is wherever your log pile is. It's a prime variable affecting the cost of harvest. Definitely not the most important variable, but certainly important. The longer your skid distance, the more it will cost to harvest your wood. Now, to a certain extent, this is an unavoidable cost of business. One way or another, you're going to have to move your wood. Sure, maybe you can build a road or something to shorten the distance, but in that situation, you're just kind of moving around costs with arguable benefits. Some wood is just always going to be more expensive to move. The main problem really comes down to averages and the problem they present with smaller harvest blocks, and it's not even necessarily a problem. So let me explain this. With larger harvest areas, costs and revenues are averaged out, for better or worse. So in a normal harvest like this, we have wood up here, which is going to be expensive to harvest, but then we have wood down here, which is going to be super profitable because you barely have to move it. And if we're harvesting both at the same time, we're not going to feel either one very much. It just averages out to be okay. However, if you're operating in small areas, this area is going to be awesome, and this area is going to suck. To a certain extent, it's largely psychological, but psychology matters, especially if you want someone else to cut your land, because smaller harvest blocks are already going to have difficulties in that department. So what you might want to consider at the very least is alternating from one year to the next. One year cut a block closer to the road, and the next year go farther away. Or doing one of each the same year. What I would avoid at all costs, however, is starting from the front and working your way back. It's a very real temptation, but it almost never works out well. It's just geographic high grading. The exception is if all the wood that needs to be cut happens to be in the front, which is actually the case on my land. But it's still not ideal. Next, we have slope. This is a universal rule, but absolutely critical for small-scale systems. Do not pull wood uphill. Do not pull wood uphill. That may seem obvious, but it really isn't, because you're probably thinking of obvious steep slopes. But here's a thought experiment. Imagine a smooth concrete surface sloped to an almost imperceptible degree. Put a truck on that concrete and put it in neutral. Now imagine pushing that truck uphill and then downhill. Even with such a slight slope, you're going to be able to feel the difference. A lot. And the slopes in a forest are a lot like that. They're often imperceptible, but they make a real difference in the energy that needs to be exerted. So always make sure, to the best of your ability, that your trails are designed in such a way that when the machine is going uphill, it's empty, and when it's carrying wood, it's going downhill. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but you have to try to minimize it. Which brings us to our next point, terrain. Obviously, there's going to be some types of terrain that are just going to suck and increase your costs and time spent hauling. Namely, wet, muddy, and soft ground, rocky terrain, and also all those slopes. Obviously, you're going to want to avoid those areas, but sometimes you have to cross them. So you have to think of terrain in terms of volume. The net impact of a terrain obstacle is the volume of wood that has to cross it. 
So on the map here, let's just say we have some soft ground over here. Well, it's at the end of a trail, so we don't really have a lot of volume that needs to pass over this area. Not a big deal, just throw some brush on the trail and you're good. Now right here, every stick of wood on this property has to cross this area. So the impact could be devastating. So the first line of defense, as we talked about, is to avoid it. But if you can't, you need to spend some time to create a solid crossing. Uh, maybe a skid bridge if you have access to one, or I put down what we call corduroy, which is a mat of perpendicular logs, and that works really well. The key is you have to be able to identify the issue and find a solution to make it workable and mitigate the impact. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So that's really it, guys. If you can do those things, you're looking good. That takes care of most of your potential problems. If you watched this and you learned anything at all, I probably saved you a lot of time and frustration. So I think that's worth a like and a subscribe. And of course, if you want to learn more about forest management, grab my book, How to Read Your Forest, which you can get for free in the link in the description and comments below. It covers the basics of forestry and gets you started on your path. If you're interested in taking it to the next level and creating a more intricate management plan like what we've talked about today, then join Silva Cultural. If you join now, you can get lifetime access to all our features and tools, including our mapping tool that you can use to map your property, plan harvest blocks, and export GPS-compatible maps, uh, our harvest planning tool, which allows you to calculate how much of your forest you can sustainably harvest, our growth estimation tool that you can use to get estimates of growth and yield using data from FIA plots, our financial analysis tool to help you compare the financial viability of different forest investments, and our courses, which currently include a silviculture course and a tree felling course. So join now and get lifetime access to all that in any future releases. So it's a really amazing platform to have for any small landowner. Go ahead and check it out. So I'll leave you with that and I'll catch you guys later.